do a great job for Knoxville, they do a great job for Tennessee, and I'm privileged to, uh, to be their colleague. How many of you, either from Walt Disney, TV, or maybe Tennessee history, remember a fellow named David Crockett? How many of you? Raise your hands here, a fellow named David Crockett. He got his start right in this neighborhood. He moved across Tennessee. He wound up on a farm four miles, literally four miles, had my son look it up. We learned about Google Maps this week. Four miles from our farm in Wheatley County in northwest Tennessee. In 1816, he was running around, and he decided to go down into Alabama, which the United States of America had just acquired, or maybe more accurately taken, from the Creek Nation. Now, if he talked to some of us who were ball fans, we would have told him the fall is no time to go down into Alabama. Bad things can happen to you if you're not careful down there. Brent Tyree, you know what I'm talking about. But he went, and he went with some of his neighbors, and he got down there, and he fell sick. Had something they think maybe was malaria. He got so sick that his neighbors left him down there, and when they came back to Tennessee, they told the folks in the community where they lived that they had left him and he had died in Alabama. So sure, so sick was he and so sure were he, they that they said he had died in Alabama. Well, you know what happened with David Crockett. Up from the grave he arose, so to speak, and he came on back to Tennessee. And people were shocked to see the dead David Crockett. And the dead David Crockett was shocked to find out he was dead. And he said later, he said, I know that them telling that I was dead, I know that was a whopper of lies as soon as I heard it. <laughs> you know, some people have said that the Democratic Party is dead, that the Democratic Party is out of it, that the Democrats have lost, and it's not what it's going to be. It's not what it's been, and, 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 and they said we're dead. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that like David Crockett, I knew that was a whopper of a lie as soon as I heard it. God is here tonight, and I don't know if y'all fully appreciate who he is and what he does and who he works with. Nancy and I, my sweet bride of 24, almost 25 years now, the long sucker Nancy, would y'all welcome her and thank her <laughs> for putting up with me for that point of century on the The long sucker Nancy and I have had the privilege to get to know Gabrielle Giffords and her husband Mark, and we were with them last New Year's. As a matter of fact, last New Year's, our boys and her stepdaughters and some other kids were dancing together, and Gabby and Mark and other friends and I were wishing each other a very happy New Year. And exactly one week later, I was at home in the library, and I saw the post had come across on the email, and my family heard me call out. We turned on the television, we turned on the radio, we looked on the Blackberries, and we got the news reports. We got on the phone with a friend of ours, somebody that Gabby and Mark know and that we know who works for NPR, and we talked with him, and he confirmed what we'd heard on the radio, the television, the Blackberries, that indeed she'd been shot, shot in the head, and it did not look good. And I don't know if any of you were following it, but I remember, I will never forget as long as I live, when the report came from CNN that Gabby was dead. And we cried, and we cried. And after a while, there was another news report that said Gabriel Giffords, like David Crockett, reports that their deaths was exaggerated. And Gabby was still living. It didn't look good. She'd been shut up. She'd been shot in the head. But she still survived. That was just last January. And I don't know if you watched it the other day on August 1st. When she came on, somebody did, I know. When she came on the floor of the House of Representatives, ladies and gentlemen. And one of her colleagues, one of her, her colleagues said, it was as though a dead person had gotten up and walked on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. I'll tell you how miraculous it was. Michelle Bachman and Joe Biden hugged each other. That's how miraculous it was. Now there's an odd couple party, I'm telling you. 
One of Gabby's Republican colleagues said, every once in a while there comes somebody who has the kind of spirit about them, the kind of determination, the kind of hope and trust and faith that she has. And she changes people. And she changes this country. They said Gabrielle Giffords was dead. And they were just as wrong about her as they were about Davy Crockett about 195 years earlier. Let me tell you what happened with Nancy and me, the long-suffering Nancy and me, two decades ago. I don't know if any of you remember, you women remember what you said to your husbands when you told them this. I don't know if any of you men remember what your wife said to you when they said this to you. But Nancy told me, I'll never forget, she said, we're expecting. And I remember what I said. I said, who's coming over for dinner? <laughs> she said, you don't understand. She says that a lot to me. Some of you men can relate to that. She said, you don't understand. I said, well, tell me. She said, well, we're expecting a baby. And I said, my goodness. Or something like that. <laughs> and I said, well, she was in Nashville. She was working at a church in Nashville. I was back home in West Tennessee, about 145 miles away. I said, well, come home. She said, why? I said, well, we, we, we've got to be sure. She said, well, I've already taken two of those tests. I said, well, well you, need, you need to see Lou. You need to see I, our, my buddy, my prayer partner. I meet on Wednesday mornings for Bible study. Uh, Lou was our family doctor. And I said, you need to come home and see Lou. And she said, why? It's not like the baby's going to be born, you know, anytime soon. I mean, we've got a ways to go. She, I said, you got, you, we got to be sure. Well, the long-suffering man said, you're laughing. I bet your husband was kind of like this, kind of a little misguided. She, she, the long-suffering Nancy drove 145 miles home. She met Lou at the clinic after hours. He was my dear friend and is my dear friend. And he gave her, unfortunately, the same test she'd already taken twice, Lee. And on that third time, sure enough, we were still expecting. <laughs> I was a little troubled, but, 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 but we knew for sure then, or at least I did. And uh, so it was a pretty exciting thing. Now, I, I don't want to tell me misunderstand this. I knew she had been exposed. I just did not know she had caught anything at that point. You understand what I'm saying? So a few weeks later, sorry young people, y'all probably, probably understand more about this than some of it. You can explain it to these older folks later. The, uh, a few weeks later, we went to see the D-O-B-G-Y-N and Martin, and, and she said, would you like to go to North and Sound? I was heading, Jeff, uh, a healthcare cost contained study committee at that time. And we said, sure, we'd like to have an ultrasound. And I asked Nancy what an ultrasound was. How many of you have ever seen an ultrasound? Raise your hands. Most of you have more and more all the time, really. For those of you that haven't, what they did with my sweet bride was they had her lay down on one of those funny tables in there. And they strategically rearranged their garments. And they took some of that same natural grease, Mr. Chairman, that, that we used to use on our ball ball 400 tractor in, in Wheatley County. And they applied that to their abdomen. They took this plastic magic wand. They rubbed that thing in the axe of grease. And then we watched on this little TV. Now it was a doctor's office. She thought they'd had a big screen television about twice the size of the screen here. You know, in color and everything. This little old bitty black and white television. When I was growing up, we, we just had television. You young people won't understand this. We had television antenna. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and you, you know, Kate Gerard, a TV. The only way you could get Cape Girardeau TV in, in my part of the world was the wind had to be out of the southwest at 24 miles an hour, and the barometric pressure had to be just, just right, and then sometimes you could kind of make out Cape Girardeau from time to time. <laughs> well, we're looking at this thing, it's like Cape Girardeau TV. You can't tell anything. It's just black and white and fuzzy, and the doctor's rubbing that thing in natural grease, and then he says, look, there, she says, look, there's the little heartbeat. And sure enough, a little blip on the screen, and I said, honey, it looks just like you. <laughs> that doctor kept rubbing that thing in the axle grease, and then she got a little excited. She said, look, there's a second heartbeat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I trained as a lawyer and a preacher. I didn't train as a doctor, but I knew this. I knew the medical certainty. If your baby had two heartbeats, you had a real medical problem. <laughs> and then the doctor explained, said, no, it was two babies. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I didn't know it was that serious. Well, that doctor kept rubbing that thing in the axle grease, and I, and I started to ask her to stop, and I waited too long, and then she got real excited. She said, watch that, or they're free. And my wife, she let it take it off that table. 
I know she did, because as my knees buckled and I fell toward the floor, I could see daylight between her and that table. <laughs> that doctor kept rubbing that thing in the axe grease. I'm begging her to stop. Please, please, ma'am, stop. Put that thing down. I didn't know what she was doing with that thing. Finally, she, she stopped. She said, I think there are just two babies. Ladies and gentlemen, I said, thank you, Jesus. What in the world will we have done with three or four or however many she can get out of the thing? I was so relieved to be just having two babies. We left. I found out later, Nancy in the waiting room. True story, she met two other mothers, prospective mothers of twins in the waiting room during the course of this pregnancy. On both of them, the doctor took them up to three, back down to two, they left hand because it's a practice technique. They taught her in the medical school, I guess. Well, a few weeks later, we were having some complications. I don't mean just the complications that Nancy was having living with me. I mean complications, complications. And so we went to see a, a specialist in Nashville, and we were referred to this high-resolution ultrasound specialist. And sure enough, he was a city doctor. He had a big screen TV, not quite this big, but a big screen TV. It was colored. And we saw there, and you could tell that either we were having twin boys or two girls with wicked senses of humor. And my wife, she grew up with her mother, her sister, her female dog, her five to one outnumbered dad. And I told her that Dr. King had said the arc of the universe is long, but it swings toward justice. We, I was going to get her a boy puppy dog just to even everything out when we got those two baby boys home. I suggested names for them. I suggested Roy Jr. and Roy the Third. <laughs> it did not take her long to reject those suggestions. And it was just one of the happiest moments of our lives. And then the specialist said to us, he said, you have a complication. It is called parental twin transfusion. He'd seen it, he said, in 16 cases, in 15 of those cases, both twins had died. In the 16th case, one twin had died. 32 babies, I'm doing the math, 32 babies, 31 dead. He recommended we abort. And it was just about that quick and that blunt. Nancy's in tears, she can't speak. I'm choking back tears. I'm trying to ask questions. How sure are you, doctor? He said, he was sure. I said, like 90, 95, 98 percent certain? He said, yes. I said, are there any alternative treatments? He said, well, there's some tried them unsuccessfully. And again, he recommended we abort. We had six visits with three physicians at two hospitals in 24 hours, and we got into care of a guy named Sal Lombardi, who was a little more hopeful. He did not disagree with the diagnosis. But he was a little more hopeful about the prognosis. He said if we could keep the babies in, in utero a while, we might yet take two babies home. And so we went back to the place where we stayed when we were in Nashville. Nancy was working as a, as a minister at West Indian United Methodist Church. And that night she had her Bible study group over. I called it the Uppity Women's Bible Study because every one of those women was doing something women had not done before. Nancy was the first woman to be a minister at on the staff at West End Methodist Church. Another one of her friends was the first woman to be running uh, a certain department within a hotel system. And another one was doing a, a, a selling job that nobody had ever done. Another one was the chief financial officer. No one had ever done that in that company before. They were the Uppity Women's Bible Study. I mean, they, they were doing things. They didn't know women's places was to you know, stay home and do whatever they were told. They were doing things that women had never done before. They got together that night and uh, they put Nancy in the middle of them. And they put their hands on her and around her and hugged her and prayed with her, including one who none of the women had ever, had ever heard pray out loud before. And even she prayed out loud for my wife that night. And people were praying all over this state and on where Nancy had been on a mission trip in the Caribbean. I never will forget a friend of mine here in Knoxville had her and the entire church praying every Sunday out loud for our babies. We got to election day. You can't make this stuff up. August 2nd, election day. Nancy had already voted absentee. I had not. We went to see the doctor that morning and then I was going to go home to vote and he said, this is the day. He was trying to balance out the big twin and bigger twin against the life of the smaller twin, the little Little twin was getting less and less nutrition. The bigger twin was not under as much stress. So again, his lungs were not as developed, and therefore he had a danger. And he was trying to get that time when the little twin would not be too late for that one. But 
far enough along so the pair of twins lungs would be developing enough to survive. And he told us, he said, I, I don't think the little twin will survive until tomorrow. You're ready to deliver this morning. And so we went out and we were headed over to the hospi hospital. And I told Nancy that I had not voted, which she knew. She also knew she told me I would go ahead and vote absentee earlier and I had not. In fact, she reminded me of. <laughs> and I told her that Miss Eileen Fisher would be in Dresden at the courthouse where I generally voted. And I thought I could drive home and hurry back. And I could be home back probably for the birth of one of the babies, maybe both of them. And, my wife, who normally has a very delightful sense of humor, explained it to me, and I picked myself up off the floor of that car and drove her right on over to that hospital as she instructed. <laughs> and we went into that operating room, and there were more people in robes. They, they let me go in, but they explained to me that with all those doctors and all those nurses, they had enough for her and the two babies. They had not one. In a big old hospital like Granville, they had not one doctor or one nurse for the day in case I passed out or couldn't you know, make it through this process. So I was all on my own. The babies were born, they let us see them for a moment, and then they whisked away to the NICU, and they spent 28 days in the NICU. They got down to three and a half and two and a half pounds. And then by God's grace, they turned around and they started growing. And then after 28 days, those doctors committed medical malpractice and sent those two babies home with a pair of parents who had collected 18 years of higher education and not had one single course in parenting. And ladies and gentlemen, those babies made it for a while. Matter of fact, those babies did pretty good. And when I look at these public school teachers and these public school students, I know what babies can achieve, even babies who are given up for dead by some. Those boys both achieved national merit recognition. They went to public schools every day of their academic career. And they're here with you tonight. I wish you'd welcome John and Rick here. My precious son. That specialist that we refer to not so fondly as Dr. Bloom, he said they were dead. He said they wouldn't make it. He said they wouldn't live. He said we ought to abort them. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, they are alive and very alive at times. They're 21 years old, it's just the other day. And we were blessed. I'm here to tell you, I've seen Democrats get down, and I've seen Democrats say we can't make it. I'm here to tell you. David Crockett, they said he was dead, he wasn't. They said Gabby Giffords was dead, she wasn't. They said John and Rick were going to die, and they didn't. And on the political front, you and I have seen the same thing happen time and time and time again. We're here honoring Harry Truman. Of all people, do you remember the story of Harry Truman? Do you remember 1948? Some of you may personally remember it. Others of you have read about it. It's been called the largest political upset in American political history. He was so out of it, it was so certain he was going to lose. The Democratic Party is shattered. You had Wallace who was running as a progressive. You had Strom Thurmond, future Republican, running as a Dixocrat. You had Harry Truman with whatever was left. And then you had a Republican who was going to kick as you know what. The election was over. Everybody knew it was done. They polled all over the country. They reported the polls. Truman's opponent didn't even bother to campaign, so sure was he in the election. And you remember that iconic photograph, Harry Truman, on the day after the election, holding up that Chicago newspaper that says, Dewey wins. Dewey wins. Except for all those who wrote Harry Truman off, for all those who wrote his political obituary, for all those who said there was no way he could win, he became give him hell Harry. Now he didn't tell you, he didn't give him hell, he just told the truth and they thought it was him. <laughs> but he came back and he won and he was a phenomenal and amazing leader. It's more the norm than the exception. Think about, think about Jimmy Carter, ladies and gentlemen. Got beat running for the state senate. Got beat running for governor. Finally got elected governor. Served one term. Started running. Everybody was laughing. It was a, you know, it was a topic of humor, not a serious discussion. Some peanut farmer from Southwest Georgia, Georgia, who'd served one term as a governor, was going to be elected president. No way in heck. Except you know what happened. You know how it turned out. He got elected. Think 
remember about Bill Clinton? You remember when Bill Clinton started running? They called him the Seven Dwarfs. None of those guys of any stature. Everybody knew Bill Clinton had problems. I knew. I, I knew I didn't want him married to my sister. I didn't want to be my brother. You know, you know, you know some of y'all knew the same thing. Everybody knew that. He had all those problems. And Lord, he, you know, if they could find Vietnam, he sure couldn't find it back when they were looking for him. You know, before all that came out, we knew there was no way he could be elected. George Bush was at 80% in the polls, ladies and gentlemen. 80%. And then, and then he became the comeback kid, the man from hope became the president and became one darn good president. Now he still, I still wouldn't want to be my brother-in-law, but he, he became one heck of a president. And I wish heck he was president over his last eight years. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to look very far back. I can tell you that I knew for one thing, for sure, that in the last presidential election, there was no way that some guy from the south side of Chicago, who was African American, whose middle name was Hussein, and had a funny name, Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. I, the one thing I knew for sure, he would not get the nomination. And after he got the nomination, I knew he would not be elected. And yet, what happened? It's more than more than an exception. And right here in Tennessee, I remember in 1970, some of y'all do too. In 1970, we had a Republican governor, two Republican U.S. senators. They had the majority of the congressional seats. They'd taken the Tennessee House of Representatives. Sound familiar to you? And they said the Democrats are through. That was 1970. We took back the governorship. We took back two U.S. Senate seats. We took back the majority of the congressional seats. We took back the House. and kept the Senate. Ladies and gentlemen, we're just... It's not that the Democratic Party is dead. It's for like the bombs. Now, I hope every one of y'all can relate to this. We may not be at the top of the standings today, but I know where we're headed, ladies and gentlemen. We're on our way back. We're going to make it. We're not dead. We're just starting to fight. We're just doing what Democrats do. You want to tell how Democrats are going to win? You want to know when Democrats fix the win? It's when people start writing us off, saying we're dead, saying we can't do it, saying we can't make it. That's when we're going to win. That's when we're going to succeed. That's when we're going to excel. But we see the people of faith and hope, and we know in what we believe, and we know in who we trust, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm here to tell you, I've watched what they've done in Nashville, and I've watched what they've done in Washington. And I'm tired of watching what they've done. I look at these teachers here, it's all like good looking in the eye. I voted with them every time. I voted against this other stuff. I watched those folks come. I watched them talk about teachers like they were worse than a than a dog that couldn't catch a cat. I have to watch them talk about teachers like they're terrible. They disrespect the teachers. They diss teachers. They've done everything in the world except support them. They've taken your tax dollars and the Senate's approved giving it away to any private school in the state. The Barack, excuse me, the, the Osama Bin Laden School for Young Parents could apply under this bill the way we passed the Senate, could apply for a grant to take your tax dollars to fund that private school and they have access to money. I'm not making this up. That's how poor the bill is drawn. Senate's passed it. It'll be up in the House this year. They may pass it too. They decided that with your tax dollars, we're going to have virtual schools, except you remember Michael Milken? You remember the guy that, that stole all the money and went to prison? You remember on Wall Street? Well, guess what? He's back. And he's one of the major investors in the company that hired lobbyists, went to Nashville, said we're going to we're going to have virtual schools in Tennessee, and they've already contracted with one of your neighbors, a county not far from here. And 96% of the money goes to this for-profit company. And you know what? They take more money, they get more money than these kids in, in, in that county. And these kids all over the state, they're lining them up, signing them up, poor kids in particular. They get more money for that for-profit company than you do in Knox County, Tennessee, from the state of Tennessee. I'm not making this up. They get a higher number of dollars than you do. Now, the difference is, with your tax dollars, state tax dollars, these teachers, you get teachers like these folks. You don't get that with a virtual school. You don't get teachers. You don't get school buses. You don't get buildings. You don't get, you don't get athletics. You get access to an internet. You may get a computer if you're poor enough. You get some books. That's what you get for your money. It is criminal, ladies and gentlemen, what they're doing. You know, they talk about it being class warfare. 
I'll tell you about class warfare. We've seen it. Why is it class warfare when Democrats talk about what the rich are doing to the poor, but it's not class warfare when the rich take advantage of the poor? Why is it class warfare just one way and not the other? I'll tell you about class warfare. When I watch them prey upon the people who've been hurt and injured and say that you as jurors are not qualified to make the decision about what's just compensation in Knox County, a bunch of politicians in Nashville are going to decide. That's class warfare. That's taking the power out of the hands of the people and putting it in the hands of the lobbyists and the politicians. I'll tell you what's class warfare. It's when they take your tax dollars and turn it over to for profit companies and private schools and don't hold them accountable. That's class warfare. I'll tell you what class warfare is. It's when they take your tax dollars and your opportunities for your children and your future and they suck those dollars away and give it to their friends and those who are a whole lot more concerned about making a buck off of you than providing a service to the citizens of this state. That's class warfare. It is not a new phenomenon, ladies and gentlemen. If you are people of the book, you know that you can go back and you can look at the laws that protected the people in Deuteronomy and in the Pentateuch. If you're people of the book, you know that that's what Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, and Micah, the 8th century prophets, railed about. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Quit hurting these folks. Do right by people. That's what they were crying out for. It's not new. Rich folks have been taking advantage of poor folks and working folks and hurting folks, ladies and gentlemen, for at least 3,000 years. The book's clear about that. And they're proposing to do it, and they're doing it every day in Nashville and in Washington, ladies and gentlemen. Call it what it is. It's not right. Now, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, I want you to remember as you walk out of here tonight that there is cause for, reason for, indeed, a biblical, an American record and a Democratic record to give you reason to hope. I've got two boys living here. They said there's no hope. There's hope, ladies and gentlemen. This gentleman sitting here, Daddy, he works for a woman. They said she's dead. She's living. They said Crockett was dead. They said Ned McQuarter couldn't get elected. They said the Democrats were through. They said Clinton and Carter and Truman wouldn't get elected. And they have time and time again, ladies and gentlemen. There are reasons to hope. Go fail from here tonight knowing that in the soul of your being that American history documents and biblical faith proclaims that there are reasons for people of faith and goodwill to be hopeful about our future. And secondly, I want you to know this. There are fights to be fought. There are issues to be dealt with. And what you do and what we do together will determine what happens in this state and in this country. Your work has never been more important as Democrats. Your cause has never been more just. You, the need for you to step up and stand up on behalf of the people who are hurting and are needing your help has never been greater. Ladies and gentlemen, this week I called a family member of one of those 30 American troops who were killed in Afghanistan last weekend, one of those 22 SEALs. A young man who was a SEAL named Vaughn grew up in Obine County in my district right near my home. Went to Obine County Central High School, graduated from there. 30 years old. You may have seen his wife on television. She was on television after this tragedy. I called his great uncle and he said, you remember me? I'm the blind one. And I knew it. I said, yes, sir, I remember you. He said, you know, what my nephew did, he said, uh, those things are risky, those things are dangerous. I said, yes, yes. Sir. I thanked him for the sacrifice his family had made and the price that they had paid. We talked a bit. And I said, I'd let him go. I didn't want to belabor and take up too much of his time. And he said, listen, Roy. He said, uh, I need to tell you something. He said, don't give up on us. I said, sir, I didn't quite understand for sure what he meant. He said, don't give up on us. Don't give up on us poor folks. We need you to fight for us. We need you to fight for us. Ladies and gentlemen, he said it to me 
And I'm saying to you, do not give up on him and other patriotic Americans. Don't give up on your neighbor. Don't give up on your fellow man and your fellow woman. Don't give up on his children. Don't give up. Stand up for them. If you'll stand up for your neighbor and these children and patriots like that man who died and that uncle who mourns him and his family, the widows and the orphans, if you'll stand up for those folks, stand up right now. Show your neighbor you'll stand. Stand up for those folks. Tell me when you walk out of here you'll stand up for them. Tell me when you leave here tonight that you'll stand for them. Tell me when you leave you'll fight for them and do a for them and you'll give them your very best. Ladies and gentlemen, stand up for each other. It's a great night. God bless you. God bless you and God bless you.